Okay, hello everyone. Um, welcome to this week's HAI, that's the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence, we commonly pronounce it as HI, weekly seminar. Um, and for this week's seminar, we're delighted to have my colleague Percy Liang. Percy is one of the foremost young researchers in machine learning and natural language processing. And although he's worked on lots of different topics, including question answering, unbiased machine learning, and understanding black box models and many other things. Um, the thing that he's perhaps um, best known for and certainly a very dominant strand of his work is idea developing this idea of semantic parsing. So how we can build executable semantics, which means how can we have humans be able to talk to a computer with the result that the computer actually does the thing that they want. Um, so we're delighted to have Percy here today to tell us about his work on semantic parsing for natural language interfaces. Um, I'll let him get underway in just a moment, but before I do, um, two more things. Um, if you'd like to ask questions about this event, um, you, there's Slido, which has just appeared up there with the QR code. Um, so I really encourage you to sort of connect on your phone or whatever to Slido and ask questions so that we can have some discussion after um, Percy has talked. Um, and the final thing I thought I'd say um, is um, Percy isn't only a machine learning and NLP person, Percy um, is also an extremely accomplished pianist, um, someone who likes to go running in his spare time when he's not looking after his two delightful young children. So welcome, Percy. All right, thank you, Chris, for that delightful introduction. Let me share my screen and then I will proceed here. Um, Chris actually did a pretty good job of summarizing my talk. Um, so um, let's see if I can expand on that a little bit. So thanks everyone for coming. Um, and I hope everyone is doing well, especially in these times. I wanna share today with you a research topic that is really near and dear to my heart. It's been uh, semantic parsing for natural language interfaces is something I've been thinking about for almost 10 years now. So let's unpack the title a little bit. So let's focus on natural language interfaces. Um, actually, let's go further and let's just look at interfaces. And by interfaces, I really mean, what are the ways in which humans can tap into and harness the power of computing? So it's evident that over uh, since the 50s, there's been a tremendous amount of shift from you know, computers that are only uh, accessible by experts to something that over half the world's population can use uh, at their fingertips. And moreover, in the last decade, there's been uh, another transition, which we're just beginning to see, which is that of using natural language to interface with computers. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with virtual assistants like Amazon Alexa or Google Assistant and so on. And these, I think, really represent the first generation of these type of interfaces that could really unlock a lot of power. What this is all really about, in my opinion, is about connecting users with uh, this large jungle of data and APIs and compute and resources. And by building natural language interfaces, we hope to make uh, all of these uh, resources and assets more accessible to a wider population, especially to non-programmers and people who might not even know how to use a, a computer. It's kind of interesting that my uh, three-year-old son is growing up thinking that talking to a computer is perfectly normal. So why natural language? So why don't we interface with computers just by using a GUI or by pointing and clicking or dancing or anything? What's privileged about natural language? Um, for one, natural language is something that uh, humans invented for the express purpose of communication. And it's also something that we already know. But I wanna highlight two properties of natural language that structurally make it, I think, a really powerful medium for communication. The first is compositionality. This is the idea that goes back to Frege that says, if you take a small set of words, you can stream them together in all sorts of different ways, create an unbounded set of meanings. And this gives natural language this kind of power. 
The second property is ambiguity. So the word in, in all these sentences, means something different. And yet we're able to understand what in means and by disambiguating from context. So now some might think that ambiguity is, is, a, is a kind of a, um, is a bug. It's something that we, we uh, screwed up as uh, natural language inventors, or it's just people being lazy. But I wanna really impress upon you that ambiguity is the very thing that makes language efficient. The fact that you don't have to say and be explicit about everything. And imagine talking to a close friend or a spouse and how little you have to actually say to convey, convey such rich meanings. So now let's turn to semantic parsing. Semantic parsing is going to be the tech, technology or the workhorse that's going to enable us to build natural language interfaces. And I wanna start with a motivating example here. So suppose we wanted to, a computer to understand what is the largest city in Europe by population? Well, let's try to dissect this a little bit. So there's something said about cities, set of cities. Um, there's something said about Europe in particular, things which are in Europe, contained by Europe. Um, and this is a sentence actually asking for the set of things which are both cities and the things which are in Europe. It's also mentioning something about population. And in particular, we are trying to compute, take all of these things which are in Europe and cities which are in Europe and compute the population and take the one that is, has the largest value, which is this argmax operator. So what I've done is constructed a program and the process of doing this is called uh, semantic parsing. Once you have a program, you can actually execute this on a database of facts and you get out the answer. So like natural language, uh, programs are compositional. You can build a very large set of possible uh, meanings or functionality just by composing very few components. Unlike natural language, however, programs are unambiguous. And what semantic parsing is going to do is it's going to resolve the ambiguities based on context. Another thing I wanna highlight about semantic parsing that makes it uh, unique, especially in the context of uh, modern day machine learning systems is that it has an intermediate representation which shows your work about how the answer is derived. So instead of having a giant neural network that just outputs an answer and um, leaving the user to wonder how much to trust it, this shows that this is the exact computation that was performed to produce this answer. So therefore making the system more interpretable. So here's another example. You can take sentences, parse them into programs that also perform actions in the world, not just uh, answer questions. Um, in general, you have uh, a sentence mapping to a program that produces behavior. Okay, so that's semantic parsing in a nutshell. I'm gonna spend a few uh, minutes talking about the, uh, the historical context. So one of my favorite natural language processing systems is Shurdu, which was developed by Terry Winograd back when he was a, a grad student at MIT in the 70s. And this is an example of a transcript that the system was able to do. So it's a system that allows a user to interact um, with a blocks world environment. You can ask questions, you can perform actions. The system can actually resolve uh, references in context and do, do quite a few sophisticated things. And this is the 70s. So without all the kind of modern technology and the compute and the data, it was actually able to do fairly sophisticated things. And I would say, still say that 50 years later, we don't have something that strictly kind of dominates um, this. The main problem with those uh, type of systems was what Terry called the com kind of complexity barrier, which is that it would just became, it was all rule-based. So it became really hard to actually understand all the components. There were complex interactions between the parser and the, the re resolver. And there were just, it was hard to hold in your, in your head. So he thought it was kind of a dead end and moved on to HCI at, uh, at, as a faculty at Stanford. Um, and then in the 90s, uh, the statistical revolution hit uh, natural language processing at large as a field. And it kind of transformed the entire landscape from you know, information extraction, part of speech tagging, um, um, syntactic parsing. And also uh, a little bit later, it hit kind of semantic parsing. So Ray Mooney is uh, largely credited with uh, building the first statistical semantic parsers. Um, this got technology kind of got in, in improved with uh, linguistic formalisms. Uh, here's Luke Settermore, who did also some seminal work 
in this area. Um, and since then, there's been just a, a, a kind of a explosion of work in semantic parsing on different domains, the different uh, models, and, and so on. So in the remainder of the talk, I want to highlight um, three challenges, data representation and capacity, which are necessary to make a semantic parser effective. And finally, I want to talk about adaptivity, which is a new paradigm, which I think I can um, address these three issues in a kind of a clever way. So let's start with data. Um, so remember, we're in the context of building semantic parsers um, in, and in order to make uh, any modern NLP system robust, you need to kind of train this on natural language utterances. And um, one bottleneck for training is you need data. So this is kind of a familiar uh, idea in NLP. If you look at syntactic parsing and machine translation, you know, data sets have been around for some time now. Um, but if you look at the difference between the sizes of these data sets and semantic parsing, it's just orders of magnitude uh, apart. So one of the main challenges behind semantic parsing for much of its history for 20 years was really the lack of data sets. And without data, you can't really innovate uh, effectively on you know, different models and build robust systems. So one of the things I, uh, the first project on semantic parsing back at the end of my PhD was on a way to address this. So if you look at the type of data semantic parsing demands, it's quite clear why you only were able to get 880 examples. You have to have sentences paired with these programs, which need to be written by an expert or someone who knows linguistics and programming. Um, and that just doesn't scale up. So we thought maybe we could use lightweight supervision. What if we get asked someone to just answer the questions and show what the behavior should be? The idea is that now you can go to Amazon Mechanical Turk or crowdsourcing and just get a tons of data this way. The challenge with this is that it introduces a very stiff computational challenge where the learning algorithm now sees the utterance and sees this behavior, and it has to actually search over possible programs to find the right one that will actually execute the right thing. So this is kind of like finding a needle in a haystack and is, um, is a lot of what my research around the mid uh, 2010s was about how to kind of get around this um, computational bottleneck. Um, then we in 2015, we took another uh, idea which flipped the problem on its head a little bit. So traditionally, I, I think not just in semantic parsing, but most of, uh, I would even say AI, you you have examples of things you want to label like images or sentences, and you go and ask an expert or a, a crowd worker to annotate them. In semantic parsing, it could be with programs, which are expensive, or if you're fancier, you can use um, uh, answers directly. And the problem with this method is that it's even with answers, it still results in these small um, you know, data sets, which are incomplete. So what happens if we turn the problem on its head and we start with what we have? Because here we actually have to go and collect the actual inputs, not just the outputs. Um, so what we have is we have APIs, we have databases, and each of these APIs and databases gives us a set of primitives to work with. So what we can do is define a small compact grammar, maybe with 20 or so rules, that takes these primitives and says how you can combine them. And this grammar synchronously generates programs paired with some canonical way of saying them. So here is a program and this says article whose publication date is 2004. So this is training data. Now, if you train a model on this, it wouldn't be very good because these utterances are only one way of saying, um, of targeting this program. And also, it's not very natural. Article with the largest publication date is not something a real user would say. But now here's the key part is now you can take these examples, which are perfectly understandable, but not natural, and ask the crowd to paraphrase them into something that's more natural. Who has co-authored articles with Efron? Is a better way of saying person that is author of article whose author is Efron. So notice by doing this, a user, a crowd worker doesn't actually have to look at the program at all. 
So it has to have no program expertise. It only has to read natural language. So we've kind of used this trick to essentially collect data of utterances paired with the programs directly. So we apply this approach to a bunch of different domains. And one of the main advantages of this approach is how easy and quick it was to just scale up. So each of these domains took around five hours. You launch a task and you were able to um, just get results immediately. One of the reasons we call this uh, paper semantic parsing overnight is that actually the night before the, the paper deadline, we actually just added a new domain um, just to show that how easy it was. And we collected data and the next day, ran the results and put it in the paper. Um, the unfortunate thing was that the accuracy here um, on examples which are not from this data collection process was a little bit under, under, underwhelming. So one way to think about um, the space of two possible, uh, the space of data collection procedures is a spectrum where we first talked about learning from behavior, learning from question and answer pairs, which has realistic data and it was technically challenging. On the other hand, we have this overnight style paraphrasing approach, which collects bias data because the utterances generated by paraphrase are not the ones that real users would say. It results in low performance, but on the other hand, it's very cheap and fast and easy. So the, in practice, um, what typically we would do is to pre-train with the paraphrasing to get the model to a reasonable point and then fine tune with uh, the data from the behaviors, which might be uh, more realistic, but less, um, less abundant. So as you can see, there's kind of a lot of work just in figuring out the data for semantic parsing. And the, real, the reason behind this is that we don't have an existing system that um, answers questions, deep questions about a, a database unlike machine translation where human translators have done the job for us of translating documents to other documents. Okay, so here is, I'm gonna talk about representation. So now the question is how do you go from a natural language um, utterance into a program? And if you take uh, you know, semantics 101, you will learn that compositional semantics is the way you're supposed to do it. You take words and map them into bits of program and then you take these bits of program and you combine them uh, together to form the overriding program. So this is, uh, has a kind of a long history in you know, linguistics and you know, philosophy. And um, so this is the, the kind of the textbook example of how uh, compositional and semantics is supposed to work. But we know in practice that language is messy and there's many ways of saying the same thing and things don't uh, behave uh, nearly as compositionally as we want. And as a result, a lot of the work in semantic parsing up until let's say about 2015 has been developing um, you know, different types of grammars to get around this uh, uh, inconvenient truth about language. So in 2016, um, we decided to see if we can use the power of neural networks, which was be having successes in machine translation in a number of fields around that time and see if we can do the same thing for semantic parsing. So the, the idea was you know, very straightforward in a sense. The idea is that instead of using a grammar, we're gonna just pump this natural language utterance into um, a seek to seek neural network and have it just output the program. And the, how it goes from the input to output is, some, is none of our business and it's something that the neural network is going to learn. So we're gonna end to end learn utterance to programs. And um, there's another trick called data recombination, which I'm not going to talk about, but with these two ideas, we were able to at least match the state of the art results at the time. But more importantly, this made semantic parsing much, much simpler. And I think one of the reasons that there's been an explosion in semantic parsing, um, you know, post 2016 is that before it was really painful to create these grammars and deal with, uh, you know, search issues and so on. And the, the presence of these neural uh, semantic parser just makes it uh, you know, so much easier. So let me talk about uh, the third challenge, which is capacity. So let me ask you, what, what is wrong with existing you know, virtual assistants? So you know, they, they work pretty well. Um, if you ask what's a high tomorrow in Seattle, 
Um, I'm sure uh, any of these assistants will give you the right answer. But if you ask what, how much hotter is it tomorrow in Seattle than the yearly average, is it hotter than average tomorrow or is it uh, about the same? The assistants, at least uh, when I checked, uh, the, was not able to do this. So there just the, the fact is that there is just a long tail of things that you would want a system to be able to do. And the main bottleneck um, in building these systems is what I call you know, capacity. And there's two forms of capacity. One is the breadth of knowledge that can be brought to bear on answering a question. So for example, here you need um, kind of historical facts about weather, not just the, the weather API. And depth, how you're able to put these uh, pieces of information together and, and do some reasoning or computation. Here you have to compare and take uh, differences. And so one of the, the goals is that um, since maybe 2015, I've been working on is try to see how far you can push the limits of capacity. So remember, a lot of semantic parsing focus on these very narrow domains like US geography. So this goes back to the mid 90s and actually has been a data set that um, was essentially the only, one of the very few data sets that people worked on until like for the next 20 years. And this had only 10 relations and all you could ask about is US, US geography. I remember when I was used to try to, I was excited about getting save our results on this data set and I wanted to demo this. And one of the main thing I ran into is that people would ask you know, questions about uh, like Canada or um, you know, roads. And I wouldn't be able to answer, not because the system wasn't accurate, but just because it was outside capacity. So since then, I would have been trying to see how far you can push this. So one of the things that we worked on in around 2013 is extending semantic parsers to work on large knowledge graphs. Um, for example, Google had um, at the time had this freebase um, knowledge graph that powered its uh, its knowledge panels that you see on it on the side, and this had you know hundreds of millions of uh, <coughs> uh, entities and facts. Um, we decided to go further because even these knowledge graphs weren't able to cover all the set of things that people want. There's a lot of semi if structured information on the web, which uh, you could go and tap into by um, answering questions on the web um, tables. Um, going, we also experimented with uh, looking at web pages more generally. Um, 2016, we, uh, one of the motivations for creating the squad question answering data set was this frustration that even the structured, large structured or semi-structured data sets weren't enough to satisfy users' information needs. So you could go to even unstructured settings. And one of the um, kind of paradigms which I think is still interesting was um, this idea that you can build an agent that goes on the web and can perform actions, retrieve websites, do computation, and issue basically do things that you would do as a human being. So this was kind of the ultimate you know, dream of some sorts is to have unbounded capacity, at least in terms of being able to access, um, if you think about the internet as kind of unbounded. Um, so this is uh, something that's very challenging, but I, I think still kind of an aspirational direction. But, th but there's kind of this trade-off here. And um, remember, we wanted to go deep and we also want to go broad, right? So if you go deep, um, you're often limited to a, a, a small database um, of facts or a few APIs where you can actually do deep reasoning and compute answers. Um, on the other hand, if you go broad, an extreme example, it would be a web search. Um, you're limited essentially to retrieving the answers and you can't really reason because current technology isn't um, sophisticated enough to really uh, kind of understand um, the, the, uh, the facts which are written in text and synthesize them in genuinely novel ways. So the capacity is, I wanna stress, is kind of the main bottleneck behind of uh, a lot of these systems. And I think the trick is to how to try and jockey your way uh, up this, uh, this trade-off curve between depth and breadth to actually push to new types of functionality. Okay, so the third thing, uh, the, the last thing I wanna talk about is this idea of adaptivity. So what else is wrong with existing um, you know, virtual assistants? 
Um, so virtual assistants, you know, fail. Okay, so that's fine because humans also fail. Humans aren't perfect. But the problem is that once they fail, there's no recourse, right? You, you have a system that screws up and then, then you're just stuck. And you either give up on that query or you go um, do something else. Whereas a human has ability to learn from you know, mistakes on the fly. So um, with Chris Manning and a, a joint student in 2016, we explored a new paradigm for building semantic parsers that um, involved interactivity as a kind of first class citizen. So the inspiration goes back to uh, Wittgenstein, a, a famous philosopher of uh, you know, language who um, I'm paraphrasing said, um, language derived its meaning from use. So rather than thinking about language as this, uh, this kind of form that is uh, in, the, in the clouds, language is, was constructed by humans in it for doing things in the world. In particular, you can have different languages that um, are adapted to particular um, settings. So we developed a simple framework to operationalize um, some of these ideas in the modern machine learning context. And the idea is that th this is a game where uh, you have a user and you have a system. The user sees a goal that they want to, or has a goal in mind that they want to achieve, but can't actually, it doesn't have any hands. They can't do anything. And the system is the only one that can perform actions, but the system doesn't know what the goal is. Um, the user, knows language because it's a human being and the system interestingly doesn't have any language okay so the i so the user might say well okay remove red and the system doesn't know uh, what's going on so the system can try a bunch of possibilities suggest a bunch of possibilities and the user can select the correct one and now something kind of magical happens at this point the user makes progress towards his goal because the system has, can execute and perform those actions. And simultaneously, the system makes progress towards learning the language because the system now has a nice training example of that remove red means this particular um, thing. So this is a game in which we hope that the user by trying to achieve the goal can teach the system a language, but this language evolves um, from use and not uh, some sort of pre-subscribed you know, grammar of English. So this was one of the kind of the really interesting experiments because um, we ran this on Amazon Mechanical Turk and usually you use Amazon Mechanical Turk to collect data and you train a model and you iterate on this uh, data. But here the training was happening live against real users, which was really exciting. Um, so um, here are some of the, the examples of uh, users using the system to perform goals. Um, so here are the best users where best means they were able to complete the goals effectively. And you see that people use something like English, but not completely English-like, maybe there's shorthands. And furthermore, each person had uh, their own kind of personalized language. Um, if you look at uh, people who didn't do as well, um, they usually had less consistent language or there was a mismatch between the expectations of what the system could do and what the user wanted. And if you look at the people who did the, the, the worst, they were just kind of either um, you know, uh, spammers or people who did, really didn't understand you know, the task. Um, there were also people who taught the system in different languages like Polish, um, as well as uh, people who use Polish notation um, so, so this was kind of a interesting experiment where it wasn't only the, the, uh, the system that was learning, but the users had to learn and adapt over time as well. So then, uh, uh the next year we wanted to scale this up a bit more. So imagine you wanted to, you uh, build a tool for, let's say, you know, an interior, you know, designer or graphic designer. You wanted to issue natural language commands like add two chairs five spaces apart, and you want this beautiful um, configuration to appear. And now, if you were to blindly generate um, candidates from the model, you would probably you would definitely fail because the system has no idea of you know what to do from this 
So how would a human be able to teach another human this? Well, there's idea of decomposition. The idea is that, well, you would try to explain how to do this, breaking it down into pieces. So you would say maybe add a chair, move five to the left and add another chair. And then maybe the system still doesn't understand what add a chair means. So you can say a chair has four legs, you add a chair base, add a chair back. Um, and then at the end of the day, you finally get down to this point where the system can actually understand. It's like add a red block. Okay, the system understands that. So it's that kind of this top-down decomposition that allows the user to teach the system high-level language um, and in kind of interactive way. So here's the, what the interface actually looks like. So the user uh, types commands and suppose that user types add yellow palm tree. And if the system understands, great, then the user just makes forward progress. And if the system doesn't understand, then the user will decompose this and explain this in terms of something that the system can understand. So again, there's this win-win situation where either the user makes forward progress or the system learns something. And because you're always making forward progress, we, this, this kind of dynamics of this game uh, converges to something you know, positive and interesting. So we ran this uh, study on Mechanical Turk over three days and we let, gave instructions to users to essentially build whatever you want after initial trial period and be creative. We set up a leaderboard so people can kind of uh, have a little bit of competition. And people were teaching the system interesting um, things. Um, so remember, this is not natural. It doesn't have to be English. Someone taught it that left, uh, the um, left angle bracket means move left. Um, you can, uh, the system was also taught paraphrases and high level concepts like cube. Um, but what I was really kind of astonished by is what the types of uh, patterns and sculptures that people were actually able to build using this interface. So a lot of people apparently have a lot more creative uh, artistic talent than you know, I, I have and certainly uh, could even maybe um, dream of. And all of these sculptures were built using natural language and uh, teaching the system a language that enabled this task to be done more efficiently. So just to summarize the section, I want to talk about adaptivity as I think an interesting solution to the data representation capacity problems. So in the data section, we were concerned with the idea that if you did paraphrasing and data gener synthetic data generation, that it would be not natural. And the adaptivity uh, resolves the issue because you have real users in the loop providing utterances that they actually want to say. So the incentives are aligned there. On the representation front, you know, we were concerned with this idea of how you can map natural language into complex programs. And th if you're not careful, the, the learning problem actually becomes very, very challenging. But because in this adaptive setting with the learning from decomposition, we were able to have the user kind of gradually teach the system over time where the user is actually tracking the system you know, abilities. And finally, for the capacity um, issue, one of the issues behind um, that we were trying to address is that if a system can't do something that the user wants, then this is a source of frustration. The uh, user gives up um, and therefore you just get stuck, right? And the way that, um, this um, adaptive in blocks world environment was designed is that the user never gives up. It can, uh, doesn't have, you can always bottom out to low level instructions to accomplish what the user wants. And language is only, can only improve things as a kind of amplifier on top of that. So let me conclude now with uh, a few remarks. So we've talked about semantic parsing for natural language and interfaces. And the, the vision is allowing users to tap into this wealth of data and APIs on the web and access all of the breadth and depth that um, these have to offer. And I've argued that natural language is a, uh, well, a natural way 
um, an accessible way to, for users to do this and talked about some of the challenges um, for game building such a natural language interface. So I'll end with two um, you know, remarks, which uh, are food for thought and kind of challenges with um, gaining this technology. So one of the, if you zoom back, you know, why is this problem hard? Why isn't it um, more similar to, let's say machine translation? And the main difference here is that we're talking about building a system for a user to interact with you know, a computer. Right, and such a system doesn't exist. So you actually don't have um, data that exhibits what a user would uh, uh, say to a system because you don't have any example. Whereas a lot of natural language processing works on cases where it's a language written by a human for another human. And in those cases, you actually have humans who are giving you ground truth on what is the right thing to do. So it's a kind of a very, it's a slightly subtle, but I think very important distinction, which is why I think these, you know, virtual assistants haven't quite um, taken off. Um, and adaptivity is, I think, one of the, the routes, which I think can allow you to get off the ground. But I think it's, it's useful to think that, you know, these first impressions make a difference. If you put out a system that has limited capacity, users adapt really quickly to the system and we'll think about this as only something that can set a timer or check, you know, what is the weather today. And so you kind of have to have user adaptive, the system learn quickly enough, faster than the, um, the user has a chance to kind of adapt downwards. Um, and the second thing I want to stress is that stepping back again, you know, we think about what is an ML system? An ML system is something that or AI system more broadly, is a system that, well, you gather a bunch of data, you train a system that exhibits some sort of nice behavior, and then you ship it. And the system is essentially a static, right? If you use, the more times you use Google Translate, it's not, at least directly, it doesn't improve um, immediately. Whereas I think especially in um, natural language interfaces, because of such uh, of the interaction, it's important to, think about changing the paradigm so that learning is part of this system specification itself, right? It's not a system that can do the task perfectly from day one, but it's a system that does the task reasonably well to engage the user and moreover has the ability to improve dynamically over time. So and we need to think kind of rethink about users as, um, as teachers instead and change the kind of a user mindset from a kind of a direct consumer um, to someone who actually engages in part of the training process. And like I said before, this adaptation is really challenging because uh, deep learning methods are actually pretty data inefficient. And this type of fast adaptation is something that we uh, need for the interface uh, to you know, work. Okay, so with that, I am, I'd like to thank all my collaborators on this long journey of building natural language interfaces, funding organizers, and thanks for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Hi, Percy. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Your video has frozen. Um, by chance, can you please stop sharing real quick and turn your video on and off and see if we can get you back? Okay, sure. Thank you. Um, let me... Just stop sharing. Shoot. Hello, is this completely frozen? Um, so you're, hear me? Video, you're still sharing and maybe no longer, but yeah, your video is frozen. Try turning your video off and on. That's perfect. Okay, now you're live. Okay, I need to switch to him. Okay, all right, sorry about that. Okay, so I hope it's good now. Okay, so thanks to Percy very much um, for um, that interesting talk, um, telling some of the history and the current work in semantic parsing. Luckily, we have quite a bit of time for questions, and I've got a bunch of questions from 
different people on Slido, but just one more to if you um, have any questions, the thing to do is to go over to the Slido app and enter them there. You can see in the chat um, for um, Zoom, um, the, the place to go to for that. Um, okay, so there are lots of different areas in which people have asked questions. So maybe sort of slightly following where you, um, the order of your talk, maybe I should start with data first. So, I mean, one question um, from Vida Patil was, um, and I think this reflects a lot of people, um, concerns when they're actually trying to do something in industry is, well, rather than um, thinking we need big data and all of the challenges of data labeling, I mean, is there a way that we can create small and start smart data that will achieve our goal specific niche products? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I didn't have time to get into this, but I think it's useful to think about data is, is rather rather than kind of homogeneously, you have examples of a certain type, think about it more uh, heterogeneously as a tier. So um, one of the things that has happened in the last two years is this rise of uh, pre-training methods such as BERT. And you can think about that as trained on a large amount of data, but it's kind of very coarse and general purpose that allows you to improve the data efficiency you know, of, your, of your systems. Um, and furthermore, you can imagine data sets which are um, more a general purpose, but maybe a little bit more tailored towards um, you know, semantic parsing, not in a given domain, um, which uh, try to capture some elements of you know, predicate argument structure or some sort of notion of um, actions. Um, and then finally, maybe the type of data that you want um, actually at the end of the day for your particular application can be very small because you've already have a large inductive bias from uh, the previous, uh, you know, coarser but larger data sets. Okay, um, in a sort of a somewhat different direction, but in a way it's related to the data needs. Um, a couple of people um, asked about other languages. So one of them was Rachel Saunders who said, um, how much um, work is being done on non-English semantics. And I think at any rate, there's a huge issue here because you know one of the, the sad parts of all of these products is um, yes, there are things like um, Alexa and um, Google Assistant and so on, that work for a very small number of major languages. And so that you get much less coverage of different language groups um, than you get in um, broader products like Google Translate or just um, web search. Um, and, you know, that's especially unfortunate because really some of the people who could most benefit from natural language interfaces are speakers of not the most major languages. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, there is some work on multilingual semantic parsing. Um, definitely the tr most of the work is in English. Um, one way to uh, offer some consolation is that a lot of the challenges behind you know, semantic parsing are in some ways about connecting less, some sort of language layer to the actual APIs and actions. Um, and, and that part largely is uh, um, language you know, agnostic. So one baseline is you can train a semantic parser in English. Um, you can use a machine translation system to take your favorite language into English and you, get, you will get some result. It won't be um, obviously as good as if it were you know, uh, you know, worked on kind of uh, from the beginning, but it's, it's not like it will be you know, completely you know, garbage either. I think the, the, maybe one of the, I think more subtle challenges uh, behind that is that it's not just about the natural language utterances, but it's also about the knowledge bases and the you know, APIs involved. And I think uh, those are often very much English centric and the knowledge is English centric. 
like if you imagine, um, you know, asking questions in a, you know, in uh, let's say Thailand or something, um, you know, English Freebase or English Wikipedia probably doesn't have, uh, you know, great coverage over the, the things which are locally kind of relevant. So it's almost uh, uh, an issue of um, you have to improve both the, the natural language um, query interpretation, but also the kind of the underlying knowledge sources to make the whole story fit together. Yeah. Um, how much do the particularities of different languages make a difference to what you build? I mean, people have asked about a couple of, at least a couple of different languages in the questions. I mean, um, there was one suggestion that um, some other European languages would be more precise and um, suffer less from ambiguity. And on the other hand, um, you could move to a language like Chinese where you might think you've got much worse. Yeah, so there's definitely a lot of differences in languages. I think it's well, um, you know, accepted that there's ambiguity kind of in a lot of, um, there's ambiguity in all language, natural languages. Um, you know, it's true that some languages like Chinese don't have, you know, a, a tense and abstract kind of overt, but the language makes it up in other ways. Um, so I think on balance, um, these issues, certainly for the modern uh, techniques, I think uh, don't matter as, as much. I think in the grammar-based approaches where you're designing grammars that um, try to make language um, of uh, programs isomorphic to language, I think you're in more dangerous territory of overfitting to English. Um, but incidentally, with the rise of these neural models, it's, uh, you know, at least the methods don't uh, commit to anything about English that is, you know, specific. Now your data efficiency might have, you know, vary uh, because maybe um, some languages are, um, you know, have more free word order and it's harder for these models to actually pick up on where, which um, arguments go where, um, but then they make up for it by having more morphological information, which you can you know, hopefully latch on to. Okay, great. Um, let me maybe move on to the question of representation and start off with a sort of a big picture question. So at the beginning of your talk, you um, particularly mentioned the value in having an explicit semantics and that there was an explicit meaning written in a logic-like language um, for, uh, that not just the answer to the question, but then as the talk went on, you then sort of started talking about, oh, well, it'd be really great. It's a really great way to get easy data availability to make use of paraphrasing by human beings. And they're just going from language to language without any explicit um, semantics. Um, and then, um, we sort of start into sort of use of neural techniques and you know, a lot of the time in neural techniques as well, um, there isn't an explicit semantics. Um, how important is this explicit semantics at the end of the day? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think it's useful to clarify uh, two things. One is the, the use of a program, which is a logical thing. And the, the construction of that program using um, compositionally using grammar rules. I, I think the former is what I was alluding to as being um, useful um, to be, especially for uh, uh, deep calculations. I think if you um, ask a question that involves a computation and the answer uh, output is 42 without any justification, then I think uh, you know, this might be less than satisfying. But the way that you produce the program is uh, I'm very happy to kind of leave to neural. Um, the way to, I sometimes think about it is a kind of a guess and check. 
right? If you're a you know, mathematician and you um, try to prove a theorem, there's a first phase where you let intuition run, run wild and you can kind of come up with some sort of you know, proof. And then there's like the, but the, and you don't have very much actually interpretability at all about how that proof was, um, came about, but you can verify the proof and make sure that it is indeed uh, correct and what you, what you want. So, so I think the two kind of can coexist where neural models allow you to get to some sort of intermediate point and then from then on you have um, you know, more rigorous semantics that um, yeah. So if I, push, if I push further on that, I mean, the more contentious version of this topic as a question that I was, I, that was asked was, well, now we have GPT-3 so maybe we don't need any of this um, semantic parsing anymore. Um, and I guess the you know an abstraction of that question is to what extent we can just do things at the level of natural language um, inter interaction. I mean, you were sort of stressing the value of having an explicit um, program as a way of sort of being able to check. But I guess there are other ways that humans check on each other, often by asking follow-up questions or asking for explanations and things like that in natural language. Yeah, this is an interesting question. Um, I think it has to do with the depth of computation or reasoning, right? And so um, if you are doing classic question answering, let's say on you know, a, a, a search engine, um, I would say you don't need programs at all and you shouldn't have programs because the provenance or the, the, the kind of the show your work is just a web page that a human being wrote. And all uh, the question answering really is doing is saying, go look at this. And you judge, you can verify whether you believe the website, whether the sentence actually says, answers the question you, know, you want. And I think that gives uh, you a sense of comfort that um, because you, it's actually anchored in a, a particular web page. Um, now, I think, um, you know, so that's great, but if you wanted questions to be answered that are more, um, you know, synthesized, synthesis, um, then I think uh, then it's harder to verify, right? Like if you have, you know, the, I mean, the, the largest, you know, city in Europe, that's, that one's fine because somewhere on the web, it actually says the largest city in in Europe, but if you wanted some more uh, tail query, um, like even the how much hotter is it in, you know, uh, uh, today and uh, or tomorrow in Seattle than on average, um, without uh, ability to, if it just says five degrees, then it will be kind of hard to really verify under, I mean, there's an issue of trust. How do you know that's correct? And now GPT-3 can be mango, uh, can be massaged to also show your work, but then, then there's a question like, do I? And the GPT is ha very happy to say, like, I looked up this fact in the almanac and I computed this, but it's also at the same time, you know, difficult to. Uh, it's possible that makes uh, alleviates some of the issues, and it gives you uh, actually a path to go verify the answer, but. Um, I would bet that often the times it's a kind of completely made up um, explanation. Perhaps. Okay, let me move on to a couple of other things. I mean, the emphasis of your talk was on sort of clear relational denotational meaning, um, but so much of human, con human conversation isn't that its use of um, connotations, sentiment, connections. How do we fit any of that in? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Uh, you've asked me this question before too. Uh, so <laughs> the- This was from Mike, not even from me. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, so it's an interesting point. I think one of the fascinating things about natural language is that it's, it, you can say, use it to express very precise facts. You can talk about math in it, 
and you can also use it too for pure emotion and you know there's poetry and things like that and you know certainly semantic parsing is uh, a perfect tool for some of the cases where um, <clears throat> the 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 underlying phenomena is meant to be you know precise and uh, you know not an obvious tool or uh, for you know the poetry poetry case um, and I think a you know a major challenge I think in you know semantics is still to try to reconcile uh, these two you know views broadly speaking kind of formal semantics and you know distributional semantics to be a, a little bit crude about it. Um, I will say how, that the there is kind of an you know abstraction that I think um, semantic parsing can operate on. The view I've given so far is that well you have um, you're actually grounding out to real concrete APIs and executable programs, but I will say that that need not be um, you know the case for semantic parsing to be um, useful. Um, so, for example, if I, um, uh, you can, I guess one way to think about these relations is that they form kind of a backbone of um, how things are um, uh, to be, you know, connected. And you can have them as useful as a kind of inductive bias for something that, you know, reasons more, you know, softly. In other words, the executor of the program can be much more, you know, contextual. Um, maybe an ex example is, you know, I guess what was your example connotations, and maybe you're talking about how, you know, great, you know, this, you know, the this movie was, and how the stellar the acting was. Um, there is a sense in which you can the movie as an entity and the actor as an entity, and you can associate properties like stellar and. You know, obviously, I still do much harder things, right? I can sort of say, "Oh, last night on the presidential debate, it was really interesting. What was going on? Um, it gave me a real sense of the country." And I'm I'm communicating a lot of stuff, but it doesn't seem like you can get that from a semantic parsing translation of the two sentences I said. Yeah, so I think the a lot of this um, ambiguity and context and even detection of sarcasm, I think, um, can actually happen at the semantic parsing layer. If you're willing to accept, and, and this is a big if, if you want to essentially say, you know, Chris Manning did not uh, think the election was, you know, useful, and, and I guess you, that's a simplification. You probably have much more nuanced beliefs about the you know, election. I think the process of conveying what exactly what you said to that simplified form is uh, can be is on very much under the realm of you know the neural semantic parsing part, which can look at the context, look at who you are, and map it into some sort of um, distilled. Okay. Let me see if I can get in one <laughs> last question, but I'm not sure if you can answer this one. But um, um, Rishita asked. Um, can you say a little bit about the dialogue as data flow work from semantic machines and how that relates to the challenges that you mentioned today? Uh, yes, sure. I can say a, a, maybe a, a, a two sentences about it. So that was um, a new paper that you know I worked on with my colleagues at Microsoft Semantic Machines, um, which you can think about as really pushing the power of uh, compositional semantic parsing to um, the dialogue setting. Um, there's a new tackle paper out uh, that uh, you know you and a new data set that um, people can take a look at um, if they're interested. Okay, um, I think maybe time is basically up and we have to um, wrap it up there. So um, thank you so much, Percy, for giving us a few insights into this um, very interesting and promising area. I mean, I think we're sort of really still at the opening days of seeing these technologies um, deployed successfully in the wild, as you saw. But on the other hand, um, you know, I think already more power is available than most people realize. I mean, I think Percy made a very good point that one of the practical deployment 
um, problems is that people got their Alexa or their Google Assistant and they learned that you could get it to play music and to set a timer. And well, maybe four years ago, it didn't do much else. But actually, if you play around with that in 2020, there are already a lot more things that can do, quite a few of them successfully. And we hope that some of the kind of semantic parsing technologies that Percy is working on um, means that in another year or two, um, things will be able to do much, much um, more again. Um, let me just finish, finish before closing. Um, there isn't actually a high weekly seminar next week. In two weeks, there'll be the next one with Elizabeth Adams. But the reason there isn't one next week um, is that next week we have the um, 2020 um, HAI Fall Conference on triangulating, triangulating Intelligence, which actually I'm co-hosting. And so that this is a much bigger um, six hour event that will be um, having a whole bunch of exciting um, speakers talking about the intersections between artificial intelligence, machine learning, cognitive science and neuroscience. And so there's a lot of great content um, for that. And so if that all sounds interesting. I encourage people to go and look at the HAI website and to sign up to attend that as well. Okay, um, thanks you very much for attending. Thanks Chris for moderating. Thanks everyone for coming. <laughs>